Ah, that was a turn. Of course. Okay, we're uh, we're live and recording. Five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another webinar um, brought to you by ADB's Developing Environmental Law Champions, and um, we're here today with our very own Matthew. Uh, Baird, our environmental law and governance expert. Today, Matthew will present a comparative analysis of environmental impact assessment processes in Southeast Asia. He'll examine and discuss environmental and social safeguards through the EIA process in the 10 ASEAN member states. Most of us already know Matthew, but some background, he is an environmental lawyer who has been working in the ASEAN region for the past 10 years, still very young, his doctoral research is on the legal regime for environmental impact assessment, including strategic EI, uh, environmental assessment and transboundary impact assessment. Matthew has been working with ADB since 2011, in addition to obviously our, our project, on a number, uh, number of projects. And he has worked on a, the ADB TTT program for the past few years. Thank you so much, Matthew, and over to you. Thank you, Christina. Um, and Angelo, did we want to play our introductory video for the Environmental Law Champions Program? Yes, we will. Hold on. Yes, to introduce um, what we're doing. <laughs> When I first heard about the TOT program, I was a bit uh, skeptical because I thought that I'm teaching for uh, nearly two decades. What else they are going to teach me? But after coming here, I'm really, really surprised that there's so many things to know and to learn and to adopt for myself. I'm happy to report that, you know, ever since I came back from the uh, TTT in Manila, the number of students has increased. The first set of students which I taught in 2015 after I came back was four students and the next semester the registration went up to 30 students that was a maximum limit and ever since then it was holding steady between 25 to 30 and the students themselves came back to me and said that this is the first elective subject that they have enjoyed I mean, the great value that I've seen of this TTT program is really the networking they've now developed networks which have been fantastic and they've you know been exposed to other environmental law professors within their region and they're doing amazing things. What is surprising to me it is that after the TTT several of our professors um, started another group that is not for the environmental teachers alone but also for the environmental protection agency the local people who really go to the polluters to find. I never realized there were so many practical questions that has to be answered and what chemicals is toxic, why it is toxic, what's the legal basis, how much I should find. That's also uh, not only benefit those officials but also benefits the teachers because that's the real things, the real world. It's amazing. And uh, I think the group, uh, group is growing, growing, growing. By focusing on training the trainers, we create the infrastructure to ensure that this growing demand for environmental law knowledge is going to be satisfied. I think this has been probably the biggest success that the Academy has had to date because they've succeeded in mobilizing professors from all over Asia at a time when there is such a huge demand for improving environmental law and yet nearly all these universities lack the capacity to be able to teach environmental law because they didn't have people who had the specialized knowledge that the environmental law field requires. After uh, this ADB TTT program, I told my students, go to an affected area meet the stakeholders, we want to find out why exactly is this problem. For example, there was a lake nearby which was being encroached by a lot of uh, illegal occupants. So two guys went there and uh, met the residents. They went to the, uh, the elected representatives of the municipal bodies. They went to the government officials who are responsible for protecting the natural resources. So the, the moment when they reached the uh, government officials, 
uh, they got a point that these students are really going to make it a big issue and therefore uh, the government immediately acted upon uh, this issue and they cleared all the encroachments and they built a wall around the lake to protect it permanently. I think this is a small victory as a teacher that I could inspire my students to do such a thing. The change should start from each and every one of us. Look, it's been inspirational, frankly. I've, I've found myself totally inspired by the commitment, the enthusiasm and the capacity of the people that we've been very fortunate to locate. So we're actually building a bottom-up resource now uh, of environmental law teachers and to, to which we're adding all the new people that are coming in through the training, mixing with the more older experienced teachers in their own country and building a, a whole base there uh, to carry this work on uh, well into the future, and which I think is one of the most exciting things of all, to see that this project has a, a lifetime, a longevity and a sustainability beyond the actual training. Thank you very much, Angelo. Um, so uh, it's um, very good to be here with you on a Saturday morning, and I appreciate everyone um, giving up their time um, for us to be here. Um, so this lecture series uh, was developed as part of the um, Environmental Law Training Program. Um, which is being done to enhance the capacity development of academics within uh, the ASEAN Asia region. Um, and we were looking at particular um, uh, topics, uh, one of which people wanted to talk about was environmental impact assessment, which is the area that I have um, studied. So I'm going to share my uh, screen with you. Uh, And I hope that uh, comes across well. Um, and please feel free to put uh, questions, um, but after the um, presentation, we will have uh, a question and answer where, because we're on the meeting, you can turn on your uh, video microphone and, and ask questions. And so, what I wanted to do, and Christina said, look, start off by telling a, a story. So I'm going to start with a little story. Um, and this was perhaps my uh, early introduction uh, into um, a more regional approach. So in, in 2012, I was invited to go to um, Cambodia to help uh, Vishnu Law Group work on a draft in what new environmental impact assessment law with the Ministry of Environment in Cambodia. And from that work, um, I then started to get involved with um, a, a program called the, um, funded by the NECON Partnership on the Environment, which is funded by USAID. Um, and in 2014, they convened a workshop of 50 government and non-government participants. Um, and following this meeting uh, in August 2015, a regional technical working group of 25 members was formed. And this was five representatives from the five countries of the Greater Mekong area. It included government and non-government uh, organisations. Um, and over a period of two years, we developed uh, guidelines on public participation in environmental impact assessment in the Mekong region. And so one of the first projects I did for this uh, organization and this uh, particular project um, was to examine the EIA systems <clears throat> in those five um, Mekong regions and just consider um, the issues about commonality. And I have to say that one of the first things that happened at these workshops were every nation was saying and every participant said, look, all our EIA systems are different. Um, how can we develop a common approach uh, to this? Three years later, in January 2017, the guidelines on public participation were adopted by consensus as part of a recognition uh, that EIA did have many commonalities within those Mekong region countries. Um, I was also privileged to be working with the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, which had been looking since 2015 on the role of environmental impact assessment to promote a greater strengthening of procedural rights. Uh, and this included looking at the issue of climate change, 
um, public participation and another a number of those procedural rights. Um, another project that I had been involved in was again funded by the Mekong Partnership on the Environment uh, was this first book on EIA in the Mekong. And in this book, um, copies which are available on the Earth Rights International website, we looked at the six countries in the greater Mekong area, Cambodia, Lao PDR, Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, and China. And we looked at the environmental impact assessment processes, drew some common elements, looked at transboundary issues and public participation. Um, and this was published in October 2016. Um, we called it the first edition because it probably does need uh, some updating um, since then. But since then, so since sort of 2014, I've been looking quite a lot at the role of environmental impact assessment, uh, not only in the greater Mekong area, um, but in ASEAN. And uh, as I often like to do uh, is to start with the conclusion. Um, and so this is a table we'll come back to at the end of the presentation, which looks at um, the 10 member states of ASEAN, um, plus the two columns on the right um, are the Economic Commission for Europe um, and the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. And there are two um, areas um, that have got some degree of uh, commonality for environmental impact assessment. Um, and we'll come to some of those regional agreements uh, a bit later. But these are sort of the eight uh, topics um, that I have looked at and focused on looking at the idea of commonality. Um, and I'll go into some detail as to what those particular topics mean. But it can be seen from this chart um, that the green represents um, a legislation or some form of legal instrument where that item is present. Um, the yellow where some form of uh, process is conducted, but it may not be in a formal legal manner. And the gray is where that is particularly absent. So for example, one of the things we can identify is that Singapore does not seem to have a lot of green. Um, and the reason for that is Singapore is the only country within ASEAN that does not have uh, environmental impact assessment laws. It has internal policies. It has a particular pollution control ordinance that has been used uh, for many years to regulate environmental impact assessment. And it does conduct environmental impact assessment, but not in a legislatively mandated process. A number of these requirements are optional or at the discretion of the ministry. Um, one of the clear commonalities we can see um, is, for example, the EMP, which is environmental management plans, um, something that is used by all jurisdictions to regulate uh, environmental impact of proposals. Um, SEA refers to strategic environmental assessment. Again, something that is developed uh, as we've recognized that EIA, which is mostly focused on particular projects, has not been sufficient to really respond to some of the mega projects uh, that we see. Um, and SEA, the Strategic Environmental Assessment, is a process by which we can assess or examine the impact of either sectors or in a regional context, a larger context of a number of different projects. This could be energy, this could be transport, uh, this could be road or other infrastructure. TBEIA refers to transboundary environmental impact assessment, and I'll come to that a little bit later. Um, and the three particular issues of public participation, access to information, and access to remedy are the issues that we refer to as procedural rights, as the sort of the three pillars of the Aarhus Convention, which is an, a European Commission uh, convention uh, that deals with these three particular pillars, which are fundamental, I think, to environmental impact assessment. The right for public participation, uh, access to information um, and access to remedies. In other words, if the process or procedures are not followed, um, that there has to be access for people for remedies. Um, so let's first quickly look at international principles of in environmental impact assessment. So what is environmental impact assessment? Well, the 
International Association for Impact Assessment defines environmental impact assessment or EIA as the process of identifying, predicting, evaluating and mitigating the biophysical, social and other relevant effects of development proposals and other activities prior to decisions being taken and commitments made. And the key features I would say about EIA is that it must be prior to decisions. Um, one of the requirements is that the environmental impact assessment is about predicting impacts. If a project is built or a project is being built, EIA may not be an appropriate tool because it's about, as it says, predicting, evaluating and mitigating. Uh, and often that can be done by an environmental management plan. Often it can be done by uh, redesigning proposals or relocating proposals or looking at different types of alternative uh, mechanisms for implementing those proposals. But EIA is something that is predictive. And as a result, we also rely on a number of principles and I'll come to those in a moment. The objectives of an EIA uh, can be considered to ensure that environmental considerations are explicitly addressed in development decision-making process. It's also important to anticipate and avoid, um, minimize or offset that potential significant impact. There'll always be impact of development proposals, but the aim of EIA is to avoid, minimize or offset those particular impacts. Um, it's to protect the capacity for natural systems um, and it's to promote development that is sustainable and optimizes resource use and management opportunities. So it can be seen here that part of EIA is it, that it's a process. It's not an environmental protection process, but it's a way of including environmental issues and social issues in the decision-making process. And we've identified six steps, and these are the, the six steps that I've sort of seen within um, EIAs that are very common within uh, ASEAN and internationally. Screening, scoping, investigation and report preparation, review, decision-making and monitoring. And at each point, certain people have different roles. The screening and scoping. Uh, screening is often carried out by government decisions. Scoping, again, is a matter that is up to the project proponent, often acting with an environmental impact assessment. That might require some approval by government. Investigation and report preparation is carried out by environmental impact as assessment professionals who are engaged by the project proponent uh, and that creates its whole suite of issues. The review of that report is often done by government or an independent EIA body. Again, both of these three and four should take into account public participation and ideally should be based on extensive public consultation and response to public concerns. A decision that's made by an independent uh, approval body can either approve or reject the EIA and the project um, and then monitoring, monitoring and compliance is again an essential element these days of environmental impact assessment. So one of the issues that has emerged over the last 10 years um, as environmental impact assessment uh, has become uh, widely used um, by governments, not only in ASEAN, but also internationally, is whether EIA has developed as a customary norm international environmental law. Now, it has been a fairly long-standing requirement um, that states have an obligation to uh, control activities in their own jurisdiction that may have an adverse impact on adjoining states. Um, that idea um, that states have right to exploit their resources, but not in a way that it damages uh, the natural resources or the environment of other states. Um, what has happened with two recent decisions in the International Court of Justice um, is the court has recognised that a requirement that EIA be undertaken prior to any decision to approve a project has become a principle of international law. So that a project that may have an impact, and this was in the context of transboundary impact, um, cases that had a potential impact on an adjoining state, that the ICA made it clear that uh, it was a requirement prior to approving a project that there was a need for transboundary environmental impact assessment. 
The court didn't go into great deal of detail about what was required by the transboundary EIA, or indeed what the EIA itself in the national country would require. But it did make it quite clear that an environmental impact assessment dealing with the matter that could have transboundary impact was a requirement. Now, just recently, Professor Siming Yang um, from Santa Clara University reviewed 197 jurisdictions um, about the environmental impact assessment. And over 183 of those jurisdictions contain specific requirements for EIA, including all countries, with the exception of Singapore, in the ASEAN region. So the question is, given how broad that EIA has been adopted throughout these jurisdictions, has it developed as a customary norm of international environmental law for domestic projects, not just transboundary projects? Now, we have a number of principles that we have have emerged um, over the last 30 years from the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development. In particular, the Principle 10, which related to public participation, access to information and access to remedies, uh, the Sustainable Development Principle in Principle 3, um, the, and in particular, in relation to EIA, Principle 17 of the Rio Declaration that talked about the role of EIA uh, for projects likely to have a significant adverse impact on the environment that are subject to a decision of the competent national authority. Principle 14 of the Rio Declaration also codified the precautionary principle and principle 16 talked about the polluter pace principles and the requirement to use economic incentives and valuations uh, to fully integrate environmental costs into decision making. So then Let's briefly look at some of these international and regional agreements on environmental impact assessment. Um, probably the most significant uh, are those from the Economic Commission for Europe. Now this is broader than the EU. In fact, there's about 47 countries um, who are part, parties of some of these agreements. And the three major agreements that the UN Economic Commission for Europe developed were the ESPU Convention, which is a Convention on Environmental Impact Assessment in a Transboundary Context in 1997. Again, one of those things that highlighted the role of transboundary EIA in fulfilling a state's obligations not to cause harm to adjoining states. And that was followed up with a protocol on strategic environmental assessment. Strategic environmental assessment looks at programs and plans and policies, those that, for example, about energy or uh, siting of, of infrastructure might be broader than a single project. Um, and then one of the important conventions, which is now open to accession by all countries internationally, is the Convention on Access to Information, Public Participation in Decision-Making and Access to Justice in Environmental Matters. This is the Aarhus Convention. And those three items, access to information, public participation and access to justice, we consider to be the pillars of Aarhus. Um, I won't go into too much detail on the particular conventions, but each of them do have particular requirements, including notification, access to information, comments on the particular project or the EIA, um, and information on the final decision um, with respect to the project. The Strategic Environmental Assessment, the SEA protocol, talks about early, timely, and effective opportunities for public participation and also about ensuring that people can respond within a reasonable time frame. And again, it applies to policies or programs. Um, one case in particular where this was subject to litigation uh, was a decision by Ireland to have a number of uh, a new policy about wind farms, um, but it failed to take into account uh, issues of bird migration and impacts of that wind farms on birds. And there was a court case where an Irish bird group took this uh, to the international, uh, to the European Court of Justice to examine um, whether or not Ireland, the government of Ireland, had complied with the SEA protocol. Uh, and it was ruled that they hadn't because they hadn't taken into account um, this issue of bird migrations. Uh, another important um, uh, regional agreement uh, is the access to information, public participation, and justice in environmental matters in Latin America and the Caribbean. It's the Escazú Agreement, and it was negotiated over a period of seven years uh, leading up to final ratification and assessment. And indeed, uh, I can also say that the Escazú Agreement entered into force 
on the 22nd of April, which was Earth Day. So happy Earth Day and happy Eskazu Agreement entry into Force Day. Um, and the reason why this is very important, it relates to Latin America and the Caribbean, um, talks about uh, the human right to a clean and safe environment. It embodies principle 10 of the Rio Declaration relating to public participation, access to information um, and access to remedies. It talks about capacity strengthening, including with respect to environmental impact assessment. And more importantly, it talks about uh, ensuring that states have an obligation to protect environmental and human rights defenders to ensure that they can engage in all of these rights um, in terms of environmental information, public participation and, ac and access to remedies. Um, this idea of an enabling environment for people to be able to effectively enforce their rights is something that is very, very uh, important, especially in ASEAN. And in the context of EIA, um, this is where the Eskazu Agreement uh, can also uh, provide some uh, parallels for what we might wish to do in EIA in ASEAN. Now, ASEAN itself did actually uh, draft an agreement uh, which included impact assessment and transfrontier or transboundary environmental impacts. Um, this was negotiated and concluded in 1985, but it was only ratified by Thailand, Indonesia and the Philippines. So this agreement on the conservation of nature and natural resources um, has not yet entered into force. Um, in some ways, it was a precursor many of the principles that were ultimately adopted in 1992 in the Rio Declaration. But it did make it clear, even at that point, um, that the ASEAN parties identified impact assessment or environmental impact assessment was something that should occur um, before uh, projects are approved. And more importantly, uh, recognised that there was an international law obligation to ensure that activities under their jurisdictional control do not cause damage in environment or natural resources of other parties. And Article 20 also identified the role of environmental impact assessment to ensure uh, and notification uh, and engagement of the other adjoining state parties um, of projects that might uh, potentially impact uh, those other jurisdictions. Um, but there is also an important agreement uh, on environmental impact assessment uh, in a regional context and in a transboundary context um, in the Mekong River Agreement, which was signed in 1995 after Rio Declaration and again incorporates um, some of the dual issues from ASEAN, um, as well as the international principles that were identified in Rio. So it talks about the Mekong River Agreement, it uh, talks about the protection of the environment. It also talks about sovereign equality and territorial integrity, again, one of the key pillars of the ASEAN economic community. Um, but it also led to the development of what became the prior notification, prior consultation and agreement, which was a process developed in 2003 to ensure that projects uh, on the Mekong River and subject to that agreement were notified and there was consultation uh, which were meant to occur prior to uh, the approval of that particular project. Um, one of the things that happened under the, this prior notification, um, what we call the PNPCA, prior notification, prior consultation and agreement, is that then the Mekong River Commission also then developed in 2002, a draft system of EIA in a transboundary context. It also developed guidelines on strategic environmental assessment, cumulative impact assessment, public participation, um, and a number of sector guidelines, in particular dealing also with hydropower, but also other works that were going to be conducted on the Mekong River. Um, they were drafted in 2002, they were revised in 2009, they were further revised and released in 2017. However, they still remain a draft. So in some respects, although the Mekong River Commission certainly has some elements of transboundary environmental impact assessment, um, the final uh, system ha has not yet been uh, fully adopted. Uh, one of the reasons might be because these proposed systems had a number of obligations which included conducting all of these before the national state approved the particular project. One of the issues that occurred on the Mekong is that a number of 
hydropower dams, including the Zaburi Dam and the Pakbeng Dam, were actually approved prior to uh, the consultation process um, on the transboundary EIA being concluded. Uh, we also have a number of safeguard policies uh, from a number of international finance institutions, which are very relevant within um, Asia and the ASEAN area. So this then sort of gives a broad overview of um, environmental impact assessment um, internationally and also a little bit within the Mekong region. And so now bringing it back to the study and where some of this study um, fits in. Well, the ASEAN Charter has included as one of its um, purposes, the promotion of sustainable development, so as to ensure the protection of the region's environment and the sustainability of its natural resources um, and the high quality of life of its, of its people, the presentation of its cultural heritage and the, the high quality of life of its people. Um, the ASEAN Charter also identified um, that there is this potential vision uh, and the ASEAN vision of 2025 um, that was adopted also highlights the need um, for environmental impact assessment uh, as one of the tools that can be used to achieve sustainable development. Now, EIA within ASEAN has a long history. Um, Singapore first adopted its policy um, in 1972, uh, and perhaps one could argue that now is the time to revise that 50 years later to incorporate um, all of the international legal obligations um, that a new EIA law would have. But Thailand also introduced its initial legislation along with the Philippines uh, in the mid 70s. Um, Thailand has subsequently updated its policies with further reforms coming in the last few years. Um, the Philippines has provided a number of regulations, although the law itself, the presidential decree still, still, uh, still stands. Other countries have followed suit and the latest two were Myanmar and Brunei. So at the moment, all um, ASEAN member states, with the exception of Singapore, actually has formal legislation that deals with environmental impact assessment. Um, but other things have changed since those um, uh, laws on environmental impact assessment. Um, since many of those, we've now had the Aarhus Convention, the uh, ESPU Convention, um, we've now had um, uh, the SEA Protocol, um, we've had the ESCAZU Agreement. Um, also since then, a number of uh, states have also acceded to the um, Mekong River agreement uh, and the PNPCA process. So all of these things had, uh, including um, the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, have made um, the, I guess, the, um, the platform or the current state of uh, these procedural rights in ASEAN far different from when a number of these legislation and this legislation on EIA was drafted. Um, and the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, which was adopted in 2012, talks about that every person has the right to an effective and enforceable remedy, which we can see is some of the, the same things that the AUKUS Convention and the ESCAZU Convention identify. Um, it also talks about that um, the right of every person to an adequate standing of living, including the right to a safe, clean and sustainable environment. Um, both the AUKUS Convention uh, and the ESCAZU Agreement identify this right to a clean, safe, sustainable environment um, as a human right. Um, so the focus uh, of this analysis on EIA systems looked at these particular areas, and we can discuss these um, in, in more detail in the question and answer coming up. Um, the idea of screening categories for project assessments, which projects should require an environmental impact assessment. And, it would be fair to say that this is an area where while all countries do have screening uh, for project assessment, they vary widely. Um, and for investors, it might be an advantage to know which projects are likely to have uh, environmental impact assessment. Um, the three pillars of the Aarhus Convention and the Escazu Agreement, public participation, access to information, access to grievance mechanisms, the principle 10 of, of the Rio Declaration, um, these three items have, have also um, vary in terms of uh, application. Um, I mentioned the public participation guidelines that had been developed um, for the Greater Mekong area, again, bringing together five different countries uh, who agreed on a process of public participation. Um, 
also the work of, of the ICHA, the ASEAN Intergovernment Commission on Human Rights, which looked at the role of access to information, which in some respects is even more important. So some states have clear uh, guidance as to what information, environmental information is available. But there really needs to be some form of greater detail about access to information. The draft EIAs, what information um, needs to be given to the communities um, and made publicly available to enable comment and effective comment. Um, part of that access to information also means what happens if people are prevented from accessing that information or indeed if they use that information to run a campaign against a particular project. And we've seen many cases um, people are sued for defamation or trespass when they've uh, formed um, protests to oppose particular developments and particular um, projects. So the third pillar, the access to grievance mechanisms. Again, something that is guaranteed under the Human Rights Declaration, something that is recognised recognized as being a pillar of environmental impact assessment, and this varies between countries. Some countries, such as Singapore and Indonesia and Malaysia, um, have fairly strong access to grievance mechanisms. Um, other countries, such as Myanmar, have uh, procedures where uh, complaints can be done first to the ministry uh, and then to the courts. However, since the Myanmar EIA has been adopted, there have been no um, appeals against any approvals issued by the ministry uh, because that grievance mechanism is not well detailed. Um, Singapore, um, people have access to the courts to uh, seek orders from the courts for access to information and to ensure greater public participation. Um, but these are not clear. Uh, these haven't been used as effectively um, to force um, a change or a clarity in terms of access to information and public participation. In terms of transboundary EIA and strategic EIA, these are two elements uh, that are particularly important to major projects or sector projects. Uh, and again, there is a vast difference between um, the various um, states within uh, ASEAN. A uh, transboundary EIA, as we can see from this chart, is mentioned in a few countries, Thailand, Lao, PDR, Brunei, um, where there is specific reference to transboundary EIA. Of course, transboundary EIA is clearly a requirement under international law, and one could argue that now is the time for national um, laws or a regional agreement to identify the need for transboundary EIA as clearly and, and also help to find the processes. How is it just state by state? How does it include um, consultations with NGOs, civil society and other impacted people um, in, the, in the potentially impacted state? Um, strategic environmental assessment, as I've, I've mentioned, is it has emerged from the study of EIA, but in some ways it's also quite different. Um, it's also a way of looking at a number of particular impacts from policies and programs. Um, one country in particular, Vietnam, has done a number of strategic environmental assessments um, for its energy development. And part of that process has also meant that people are able to object to the loading of, for example, coal as part of that program. Um, and over the iterations of the strategic environmental assessment on energy in Vietnam, uh, we've seen the use of coal gradually diminish. It's still very clearly part of Vietnam's energy mix and something that needs potentially uh, to be addressed even stronger. Um, strategic environmental assessment um, has been undertaken in uh, Myanmar. Um, the IFC, has, together with um, the uh, Ministry of Environment, uh, Ministry of Energy and Electricity has undertaken a hydropower SEA looking at the role of hydropower in meeting Myanmar's energy needs. This was all done prior to the 1st of February coup. Uh, and we'll have, uh, and all of that work is in abeyance um, as is the rule of law in Myanmar at the moment. But the strategic environmental assessment there in, in Myanmar um, provided um, clear recommendations, um, including no more, no dams on main stem areas of the Irrawaddy, the Chinwin, the Salween, um, designed to protect 90% of the ecological watershed. And that's one of the advantages that strategic environmental assessment can do. It can look um, at broader issues, um, both ecological, um, the SEA in Myanmar also did uh, 
a significant assessment on issues of conflict, issues of gender, um, issues of social impact in respect of hydropower and provided recommendations about potential opportunities for hydropower development. Again, those hydropower developments all subject to environmental impact assessment. Um, and two other areas that are quite important. Um, one is the registration of consultants. Many countries have a requirement for registration of consultants. Um, Singapore, Brunei and the Philippines is not, uh, not clear whether the consultants have to be registered. Again, one of these really important issues then is given that the consultants are engaged by the project proponents, um, how to ensure that the consultants also take into account all of the relevant principles, uh, conduct appropriate public participation, provide access to information to those communities who might be impacted, and ensure that those community views um, are addressed and fully addressed in the environmental impact assessment. And one of the ideas is to ensure that not only are consultants registered, um, but they also have to sign a code of conduct um, and there might be potential disciplinary measures for those consultants. They have a very important role to play. Um, in all systems, the consultant is engaged by the project proponent. Um, some argue for alternative systems, but at present all systems ensure that the consultant is paid by the project proponent. Um, but that creates significant challenges uh, and they need to be addressed. Um, and then finally, environmental management plans. And this also includes compliance and enforcement mechanisms. Um, all countries use environmental management plans um, as a way of approving a development subject to environmental management plans, which will provide the details about how the environmental and social impact of these major projects will be uh, managed uh, and adapted. Um, but Importantly, not all of them provide for community grievance mechanisms, project specific grievance mechanisms, uh, opportunities for community consultative committees, uh, ongoing information exchanges, um, and the provision for what happens in the event of uh, an accident or a problem that causes some harm. And so some people have argued that uh, the EMPs need to be strengthened to ensure for effective monitoring and compliance to ensure that perhaps bonds are incorporated uh, within the EMP uh, so that if there is a breach and there is an environmental or social impact, um, then the community can quickly access or the government can quickly access some funds to ensure uh, remediation. So I wanted to stop there um, to talk about uh, and to answer questions and have a discussion about this idea of commonalities in EIA, in ASEAN. Um, but one thing that has struck me is that there are many, many commonalities in ASEAN, but there probably exists an opportunity to provide, to learn from the Economic Commission for Europe, uh, to learn from the ESCAZU, to take examples from the Mekong River Agreement and the uh, PNPCA process, and to look at those and develop a regional framework for ASEAN to improve its environmental impact assessment in order to achieve the ASEAN objectives and the ASEAN vision. Um, ASEAN is facing many, many challenges at the moment uh, and perhaps environmental impact assessment is not on the, on the, the top of the list. Um, but environmental impact assessment, including transboundary EIA, including strategic environmental assessment, are a way of looking at development and ensuring that correct assessment, correct mitigation, correct avoidance uh, can lead to better decision making and better results. Um, one thing I always leave is what we want to avoid. Um, this is a photo of northern China, uh, a country that has had 20 to 30 years of significant economic growth. Um, but one thing that is fairly apparent from this uh, image um, and this particular region um, is that proper environmental impact assessment were not carried out. Um, we need to ensure that the processes in EIA um, using modern processes and modern developments, modern technologies, uh, ensure that communities are heard, the environment is uh, included and, and the impacts on the environment and society are mitigated and avoided. Um, ASEAN has a huge opportunity to do so uh, over the next 20 years. Um, but in order to do so, uh, we do need to upgrade um, 
uh, environmental impact assessment procedures uh, in the region. So I'm happy to stop there um, and happy, very, very happy to um, take some questions uh, and respond um, to, to the comments or, 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 or any comments as well. Thank you, Christina. Um, so, um, Angelo, uh, Christina, um, so shall I just, um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, and you can either type or I think you can actually turn on your video and ask your questions. I don't know, is Professor Yingyin, are you there? Are you able to speak? Oh, uh, yes, uh, Matthew. Uh, I would like Good to, to hear your voice. Yes, I would like to know about the uh, education and uh, awareness ratings for environmental impact assessment system. Uh, I think it is uh, important for uh, enhancing the EIA system in ASEAN and as well other country. So may I know you are on you are you are on you are point on this uh, question? Yes. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for you've done. And so I think in terms of EIA, there is a lot of uh, training that does occur. Um, but I often think that um, there are two issues. One is looking at the EIA law. For example, in Thailand, we've looked at the number of cases um, brought um, by groups uh, to enforce better compliance of the EIA system in Thailand. And some of those cases have been very, very important that have ensured that it's a fundamental requirement for public participation, for example. It's also a fundamental requirement uh, for governments to take into account issues like climate change. Um, and there were two very important cases uh, determined um, by the courts, but they're not always taught. Um, Malaysia, uh, in universities, they often teach EIA. Um, Indonesia um, do teach environmental impact assessment. Um, but I think it's very important to ensure that both the uh, professionals as well as um, the uh, academics um, and lawyers can come together. The regulators, the professionals can come together. Um, some of the projects that um, we did in, um, in, in Myanmar um, a few years ago um, with the Myanmar Centre for Responsible Business is we brought the EIA consultants together with uh, NGOs um, and the ministry to talk about um, the issues. And this is an ongoing process. Um, one of the things I can say is that the Asian Development Bank is particularly focused on, on safeguards issues, um, but sometimes they look a, a little bit just at their policies rather than the broad way that EIA is developing and is changing. Um, so I think that there, there needs to be a stronger focus on bringing together not only the academic and legal discipline for EIA law and practice um, and the practitioners uh, together with the um, uh, the work of the regulators. Um, I should point out also that this guideline, um, which is, is able to be um, downloaded, oh, that's in reverse, the guidelines on public participation, and I can share the link. Um, one of the partner organisations was um, the Asian Environmental Compliance and Enforcement Network, AECEN, that does, has done a lot of work um, on bringing together the regulators and also twinning regulators, EIA regulators in, in, in different countries to help them talk through um, those processes. Um, and a key issue for me uh, is very much breaking down the idea that national EIA systems uh, can't learn from either countries in ASEAN um, or internationally, because the EIA system is very much uh, an international system. Well, thank you, Matthew. Yes. Thank you, Professor Yin. Um, you have a question, so, Matthew. You yes. Want me to read it? Yes, please. Okay. From Li Ching. 
Dear Matthew, thank you for such an enlightening overview of the EIA processes in the region. May I know if a soft approach to the development of the principle of EIA is better and more useful in encouraging better commitment from the region to develop and upgrade EIA processes in the, in the respective countries with the hope of strengthening and better compliance in each state and beyond. Mm. Um, look, that's a very good question. Um, and for me, um, I, I always believe in, in talking about about the principles. Um, principles, if you talk about principles, if you talk about the, the core values, such as the Rio principles, um, the things that are um, perhaps both principles as well as being you know, obligations under international law, um, then you're helping people make, make better decisions um, because the decision makers always have to um, take into account, I think, those, those principles. Um, there is a challenge though, um, and one of the challenges is that uh, enforcement and compliance um, is a real issue, um, something that we're facing very much that as we strengthen the process of environmental impact assessment and I'd say a project is approved, we're still finding that there's a lot of gaps between uh, compliance and enforcement. And one of the things that, as again, as a lawyer, the other side of the principle is, is enforcement. And that could be litigation, it could be fines, um, it could be looking at innovative approaches to performance bonds or, or other forms of um, financial instruments that incorporate um, the principle of polluter pays but essentially, and economic valuation, but essentially says to a project proponent, um, you know, you must have workers' compensation insurance. It, you must manage your waste. And if you don't manage your waste, there'll be a fine. And we've got the fine in a, in a, in a bond and you, you'll forfeit that bond. Or if you destroy some trees or destroy some ecosystems or harm plants and animals um, or cause pollution, that there's already this financial um, bond that the government can, can take and used to, to, to try and restore and remediate. So, so I, I fully agree, uh, Li Jing, with the idea of the principles. Absolutely. I think, I think principles are a better way of, of, of dealing with things, helping decision makers make better decisions. But at the same time, I, I also think we're now at the stage where we have to focus a little bit more on stronger compliance and enforcements. Um, I see Professor Lai Ling Hing, um, Lai Ling Hing there. And, um, you know, one of the issues um, uh, that she might also like to, to talk about, but I can also mention is, is recently in Singapore that it has prided itself on a different type of approach to EIA, uh, recently had a very significant um, uh, breach where um, particular vegetation and, and a forested area uh, was cleared without approval. Um, and, and of course that, that sort of identified um, some of the problems with even getting the process right, you can still have, have breaches and, and need um, enforcement and, and compliance proceedings. Um, Lighting, did right. you want to? Yeah, yeah, if I can just speak. Uh, yes, we environmental lawyers are, of course, very, very concerned that we don't have an EIA law in Singapore. But um, I, and, and we are pushing our government for this. But the government says that it has a system in place and their answer is always, you know, look at the other countries, look at their environment. They've got an EIA law, but it's a mess and we don't have one, but ours is quite good, you see. But that's no answer to us. It's not good enough. So I'm with you here um, that Singapore does need an environmental impact assessment law. But the plus point is um, the new Minister for National Development has come out with guidelines for biodiversity impact assessment. But, but um, okay, I've now been asked to start the video. All right, um, but we all know as lawyers, guidelines are not the same as um, laws, right? The next point I want to mention is that um, there was a time when 
um, Singapore was, APSEL, our Asia Pacific Center, was running a, uh, well, training programs for government servants. They are not lawyers. And I remember the guy from Sri Lanka saying, you know, we wish we were like Singapore uh, and don't have an environmental impact assessment law. Because in Sri Lanka, it takes so long, you know, with the process and all that. And, you know, we've had project proponents that say, I give up with your country. I can't operate here. You know, uh, we're taking our project elsewhere. So my answer to him was quite simple. I said, I don't know the um, details of your Sri Lankan law, but clearly um, you have given too long a time for the process. So there must be fairly tight, but reasonable timelines for public participation. So that's an important uh, aspect when we look into what constitutes a good EIA law, okay? And I think Matthew raised the question, a very important question of the independence of the consultant. I think, you know, in Singapore, as you mentioned, we do require consultants to be registered. Um, but again, uh, it's a nice question, how strict is this? Because, you know, in, in, in English, we have this saying, he who pays the piper calls the tune. <laughs> so basically, if you're paying for the consultant, you know, um, if the consultant does not have integrity, he will say what the project proponent wants him to say. So uh, Matthew has given some suggestions, but I remember, I think uh, it's the law in New York state. Um, if the first EIA is found to be deficient, the government agency has the right to require that the project proponent pay for another EIA consultant <laughs> And that EIA consultant will be appointed by the government, <laughs> the government agency. So you have, to, so this is a disincentive, right? You have to pay for two EIAs if the first EIA is found to be prejudicial. So these are my comments. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you very much, um, Professor. Um, and I think, I mean, I think this is also um, one of the issues about EIA, you know, EIA is not, necessarily about environmental protection. It's a process of evaluating projects, exactly. um, but it, it's also ongoing. I mean, you know, and I think that's also where it, it's a changing um, tools are developed, um, processes are developed. Um, and and we, that's also why, um, you know, when sometimes people, they might be developing in, Sing in Sri Lanka um, or um, Australia, and they may complain about how long the EIA process takes. But I remember at an International Association of Impact Assessment, in, the, the head of the Canadian Environmental Agency talked about major mining projects took 12 months to 16 months to review because the impacts are so huge. And the EIA itself might take a year or a year and a half. So these are long-term processes, but sometimes if a project is you know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, um, one can argue that it might be appropriate to do that. I also think, and I, I think this is also something that strategic assessment, in other words, thinking more broadly, um, can often assist. And in, in the Netherlands, for example, if you do a strategic environmental assessment, that also allows um, the environmental impact assessment to be done quicker. Um, for example, if you do a larger assessment for an industrial zone, um, then individual factories within that industrial zone, as long as they conform. Maybe they don't need to have a full EIA. Um, in Thailand, they have environmental impact assessments for uh, residential apartment buildings, um, whereas in uh, many other countries, those are approved um, as planning matters. Um, so, so, you know, all countries can look at, at their systems and try and work out ways um, of, of improving. And I think Singapore's system must have worked well, but because some of these projects in Singapore are now very, very significant, um, maybe that, you know, the existing system isn't, isn't sufficient. Um, I, I don't know, uh, yes, Lang, do you think there's also I, a change I fully in agree the with types you. of projects? Yes, I, I fully agree with you. But, but um, if you look at Hong Kong's EIA, for example, it has a very tight time frame. 
you know. But I, I fully agree that there has to be some flexibility. So while you can provide for a tight uh, time frame in the context of uh, the general EIAs, if you have a very complex one, then there must be an exception. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah and, and yes, and I think many countries do have state significant projects that are given a particular clear process. Um, but for me, if you're going to do that, you have to make it clear to everyone that it, you know this is the time frame. And you, um, so, so there was a question by Ronaldo Gutierrez. Did you, Ronaldo? Are you there? Would you like to turn on your microphone? And I, I saw your hand up. If, if, if that is a. I'm not sure if Ronaldo. Um, and Nang Nguyen, did, did you want? You, you asked a question about um, the degree of enforcement between legislation and adopting the policy or rules and procedure. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's also one of the things I've identified that um, often there's um, legislation um, and that requires something, um, but sometimes there's not a lot of detail um, and in other cases, there's a lot of detail. For example, in the Philippines, um, the, the overarching um, proclamation is quite short um, and the procedures um, are the things that have all of the requirements for public participation. Um, but that also makes it difficult because as a lawyer, I always like to see a legal obligation. So um, a legal obligation that would require uh, someone to, um, to yeah, Ronaldo, did you did you want to raise your question? I see you now. I, yeah, uh, hang on. <laughs> I need to go. To oh, a sorry. Signal. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, hang on. Yeah, um, my question is with regard to. Um, I, I first of all, I'd, I'd like to say uh, to congratulate you for a very comprehensive uh, presentation, and I'm happy for you that you highlighted the role of public participation in the EI system in many of the countries in the region. Um, by way of comment, maybe, uh, I would also like to hear it probably in the future because the focus has always been on the role of the public in the decision-making process and planning. But perhaps uh, in the future, um, may maybe uh, we can delve on the role of the public in the monitoring, in the compliance, uh, of the projects that have, that have been uh, given the permit under the EIB system. And then second, by way of question, um, I've also noticed that, uh, well, the role of the public in the EIA is very much uh, recognized, but from another perspective, uh, we can also look at the public sometimes and a very uh, downside of the of this is that they're now also becoming environmental defenders. And we are very much aware of the, the recent, especially in the Philippines, no, of how, how many environmental defenders are becoming uh, subjected and, and that they, they put their lives and safety at risk. No? So my question is, do you think there's something that can be done as far as the, the EIA systems are concerned so that this risk risks can be addressed and that aside perhaps from the the procedural aspects you know, uh, as contained in our rules that perhaps the businesses the companies the the entities that engage in this project should also you know recognize values such as uh, to promote and uh, also protect the rights of the public that that are uh, um, drawn into these processes not of their own choosing but are subjected to risks thank you so thank you very much Ronaldo um, and uh, I can say that uh, last Wednesday um, or Tuesday for uh, Earth Day celebrations um, the Asian Research Institute for Environmental Law, the UN Environment Program, and APNED, the Asia Pacific Network for Environmental Defenders, together with Earth Rights, had a, a forum on protecting environmental rights defenders and environmental human rights defenders. Um, and this is clearly something that is 
for me, very important. And it came out in the Eskazu agreement because people recognize that if you have rights through access to information and public participation, um, or even access to remedies, um, you needed to be able to uh, exercise those rights. Um, and this is something that has been recognized by the UNDP in their Sustainable Development Goal 16 um, and 16.10 identified and, and certainly recently has identified a number of challenges within the ASEAN region. Um, and we saw this in a number of respects um, when the omnibus bill was being uh, debated in, in Indonesia and, and ultimately approved that civil society were asked not to um, object to the bill, which was claimed to be an economic stimulus bill. Um, and yet it deprived a number of people of their rights to comment and, and complain. Um, I did also think that because uh, it seems very much under international law, that an EIA must be done before you approve a project. So the provisions of the omnibus law that allowed projects to start um, before they had done their EIA um, is probably a breach of international uh, law. And I imagine there will be um, some court proceedings and it'll be interesting to see how the Indonesian uh, constitutional court deals with that. Um, and uh, I just also, um, we've got a couple of other, so I, I mean, for me, um, you know, one of the interesting discussions that we should have is to what extent is public participation fundamental to environmental impact assessment? In my view, if you don't have public participation, you, you can't do an EIA. But we're also talking about um, trying to engage the communities through the life of the projects, um, through consultative committees and, and grievance mechanisms, so that they constantly uh, have their capacity. Um, but remember, it also costs time and money for communities, um, not only to participate. Um, in Thailand, they've developed this idea of community EIA, which sort of is an informal process that continues at the same start, at the same stage that the project proponent is conducting an EIA. I find it difficult to see how that can be formalised. Um, we also have things, uh, principles such as free prior informed consent, which at present relate solely focused on Indigenous people, that Indigenous people uh, have a right to uh, either approve or reject projects that might impact on their land. But most countries, with the exception of the Philippines, don't actually incorporate that into their domestic law. Is that an international norm? I'm not yet sure. Uh, if it is, then that's also something that should be taken into account so that Indigenous communities um, should have the right to approve or reject projects that might impact their land. Um, the big question then is, should communities have a veto power over development? Um, and that then raises the issue that um, governments need to make, still be able to make decisions um, as to whether projects are in the national interest uh, or in a regional interest um, that may indicate that some people are going to be, um, have, have impacts. But then that raises also the question, are those governments legitimate representing the community? Um, and are those benefits going to flow to the state um, or to a few? Um, so um, I've got a question also by Ilonka Haylett. Did you, are, are you online? Would you like to, joining us from South Africa? I don't know, did you want to, um, did you want to ask your question or make, make your comment? Um, I, I, the, the question is um, about um, measuring, monitoring, measuring enforcement throughout a project life cycle, um, whether the implementation of an environmental management system in line with a published international uh, standard organisation standard, and I presume such as the environmental management system or the um, uh, occupational health and safety systems, shouldn't be part of the conditions of environmental authorisation. Uh, this requires the proponent to submit an inter external independent audit at least once a year. Um, and I thank you very, very much for that question. It's something that I think is really important, the idea of independent audits. Um, 
a lot of my work has been trying to think, do these international standards about environmental management systems or occupational health and safety systems, could we impose those on large projects as a requirement of approval? And I think we governments could, um, and people can insist on those. The important part of both of those is the requirement for an independent uh, external audit annually, um, which can take time and money. But I think independent audits are very important. And one of the lessons from India, um, which is a little bit about who pays the piper, um, as Professor Lin Heng said, um, in India, initially the project proponents paid the auditors and they came in, um, but they then in one of the states changed the system so that the uh, factory or enterprise paid a fee to the government and then the government regulator um, used a, a, a process of tendering for audits and the auditor was actually paid by the government which increased compliance rate by 70% on this idea of an independent audit. I very much think that independent audits, um, it should also be public, um, are very important because, um, and this they found out not only for environmental issues, to show environmental compliance with your conditions, um, but also for uh, occupational health and safety. It was one of the key requirements that came about in the Bangladesh uh, Garment Accord in terms of ensuring that the factories were both uh, built appropriately, but also had appropriate standards for their workers, including um, emergency exits and emergency access ways and fire drills, um, natural disaster issues because of the Rama Plaza disaster where thousands, over a thousand workers were killed because of an inappropriate building design and also because the fire escapes were blocked. Um, and so one of the things that came out of that was this idea of an independent um, audit. Again, it wasn't necessarily public. Um, and if it's going to be public, you also have to protect um, the auditor. But I, I think independent audits are some of the things that we need um, very much to look at um, for the future of, of major projects. And these projects are, are larger than, than happened 40 years ago when EIA were, were developed. Um, and we're now seeing a lot more and measuring a lot more environmental and, and, and social um, impacts. Um, so I think Ilona, I, I very um, uh, support this idea of, of independent um, assessment. Um, Zelina Sultana did, yep. Yes. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Thank you for your nice presentation. I think it's uh, not related to my region. I'm from Bangladesh. And as you have mentioned uh, before sometimes about Bangladesh, so I think I should say something. Uh, in my region, that is in my country, I think corruption, it's a major reason for not implementing the EIA properly. And in, uh, you have mentioned uh, the example of Rana Plaza. Yes, after Rana Plaza disasters, there have changed in some cases and in some factories, they also have changed their infrastructural um, condition. But uh, until now, some of the, uh, many of the factories, uh, they uh, don't follow or want to, not want to follow those types of uh, building uh, constructions rules. And, um, Monitoring system in Bangladesh uh, for monitoring system when the inspectors uh, they gone uh, for the visiting of the building or the working conditions of the workers. Um, sometimes they are manipulated and here the corruption, uh, I think corruption is the main reason for Bangladesh for not implementing uh, EIA or such types of rules in protecting environment. And thank you, Matthew, I think uh, uh, if it's uh, related to our region, that is South Asian countries, uh, EIA. Uh, so uh, I think I, I can participate in more, but as it was uh, the Asian region, so my, uh, I have uh, such a limited knowledge about Asian countries, but today I have gathered a lots of knowledge by participating. And uh, um, uh, through these, meeting or webinar a seminar, I want to make a request that please mention the Bangladeshi times when we should participate. 
because there is uh, mentioning only Indian time, Hanoi time, and uh, so on, and other countries, but not mentioning the Bangladeshi time. So I select Indian time first, and then I maintain my watch when the webinar will start, and I have to wait. So please, thank you, thank you very much. Yes. Um, and and I think also, um, you know, the, the issue about um, South Asia, I mean, yes, my, my research has been very much focused on, on, on the ASEAN, but in terms of Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, India, Nepal, uh, you know, Pakistan, uh, Bhutan, the, common, the similarities, um, I could have brought along those similarities because um, the processes are the same. I mean, India in particular uh, has put forward a new proclamation, which again would seek to roll back a number of these protections in, in India. Um, in Bangladesh, I th and I think corruption or failure to comply is a common theme. Um, and when I look at it, I always think that part of the idea um, should be to promote systems which which tries to avoid that sort of corruption in other words or, or potential for uh, um, non-compliance so that's why i like sort of bonds i also like community participation i like these things to be public um, because that reduces the potential for the project proponent uh, and the regulator to um, avoid compliance um, I mean, you know, and certainly in in, in Bangladesh, um, some of our champions, including you know the Bangladesh Environmental Law Association, some of the work that has been done to enforce those rights are still very important. Um, but we have to use every single tool we can, whether technology or um, community engagement, uh, to enforce compliance, um, because that's what I see uh, as a thing across all of South Asia. Um, that the compliance is the thing that, that is a huge, huge challenge. Um, so thank you very much. And we'll include Bangladesh time. So my apologies for that. Um, so we also have a question from Xi Jinping Su. Xi Jinping Xi Jinping Xi Unless she yes. wants to read it. A question for TBEIA in the legislations, who should initiate such EIA? The project proponent, the concerned government in bordered countries? In practice, would any international institutions like ADB, IFC initiate TBEIA? Yes, yeah, so, so that's a very good question. Um, and one of the challenges that, that is there for transboundary is who, who does what? Um, because often foreign ministry, in terms of states, it's the foreign ministry to the foreign ministry. Um, in the Mekong Region Commission, that Mekong River Agreement, um, there was a the Mekong River Commission was actually developed that it was it would receive the um, the notification about the proposal and it would communicate to its partner organisations. For transboundary EIA in in Europe. Um, a lot of European countries um, have a formal point of contact um, under um, the, uh, uh, um, the ESPU convention. Um, and that, that's a, a designated contact point where the first information contact occurs. Um, Transboundary EIA also has challenges, um, which is why I think there's a need for a formal process because um, how do you conduct um, an environmental impact assessment um, consultation um, in an adjoining country? You know, if you're in Thailand and you have a project that might impact in Cambodia, um, how do you go across the border to conduct a, a, a project proposal? Do you, do you need approval from the relevant government, relevant ministry? So that's why um, in Europe, it, it can be very uh, uh, structured. Um, and they have a, a process by which designated points between the states start that process, which then uh, ensure that some consultation occurs um, in the adjoining uh, potentially impacted states. 
Um, so it started by the states, but then um, the, the consultant for the um, project proponent uh, then has to uh, undertake the, the consultation and an assessment. Um, and there are two aspects. One is the potential impacts that might be in the adjoining state. The other is that consultation with communities and as an impacted um, people. Um, I think Dol Dina, did you have a, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, yes, Matu. Uh, uh, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm quite new uh, uh, to uh, many of you because I'm not uh, academic uh, uh, people. But uh, I work for the government and my name is Taldina. Um, I'm the uh, officer of the Ministry of Land of Cambodia and also the technical director of the Land Allocation for Social and Economic Development funded by World Bank Project. Uh, in Cambodia. Uh, we are now uh, uh, recruiting uh, several firms and research institutes to conduct ESIA for our project. Our project is about, uh, we have 107 million US dollars to do the project for uh, land allocation uh, for social and economic development. Now it is phase three uh, already. Uh, I have a question to Matu uh, through your experience. Uh, because uh, uh, we have both uh, uh, company firms and uh, research institute to apply for uh, conducting uh, ESIA. So from your experience, uh, uh, who is better, uh, the firm or research institute in terms of producing uh, what we say uh, reliable and high quality ESIA? Thank you. Uh, um and thank you. Uh, th that's a challenging question. Um, and sometimes it depends on the particular type of project. Um, uh, you, you know, is it infrastructure? Is it a industrial facility? Um, uh, you know, like uh, railways and things like that. Um, and, uh, and part of my work with uh, His Excellency Dan Saleh, uh, Director of the AA Department over many years. Um, we had a lot of discussions about also national and international. Um, and often the advantage of international firms is, is experience, um, but also local firms or local research institutes can then make a lot more detailed assessment. And obviously for projects of that magnitude, you need a lot of um, on the ground research, especially those who have um, got capacity or experience in engaging with communities. Um, you know, there are a lot of very good uh, national and international consulting firms. Um, I should say my experience over the last five years, a lot in, in Myanmar um, before the coup was that, um, a lot of the international companies that had significant ex in bringing the international experience um, with that local knowledge and that capacity to uh, uh, to engage, uh, you know, in particular with the the research and the public consultation. Um, did did that uh, assist at all? That answer. Thank you, Matu. Uh, I will yeah. consider your okay. advice. Thank you. Thank you. Too many people. Thank you. Matthew, um, we have a comment more than a question. Oh, it could be a question from Ilonka. We have the same problems in South Africa with with monitoring, measuring, and enforcing throughout a project life cycle. I just, that was oh. one of the ones I, I did answer. Sorry. About oh, okay. That. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, from Sandra Victoria, thank you for the informative presentation. The Philippine presidential decree at the time of martial law is equivalent to legislation. Rocky can correct me. I know, Rocky, we know you're there. The Philippines do have excellent environmental laws, but when implementation is a struggle, especially when there are overlaps, the indigenous people's rights, including their environment, are aptly protected by special law. Yes, and, and I think um, also there's a question another comment by 
Renee. Renee Zaldi, yeah. That's connected. Should I read it? It's yes. EIA here in the Philippines are often take advantage by the investors. They just do it for the compliance to existing policies. Nowadays, they influence policymakers and local executives to pursue several projects all over the country that lead to massive environmental degradation and displacement of coastal communities. As a research person and environmental lawyer with a together with AICHR, how can you recommend to the Philippine government to protect natural resources and the rights of the coastal communities? Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> Rocky? You know, <laughs> that's you. true. I can... <laughs> Um, I mean, would you, you know? Sorry. Yeah. Again, this. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Oh, later. Oh, yeah. Just for the question from from Sandy. Yes. Uh, the the EIA law, the PD nine five seven, was uh, issued during the Marcos era, but it was pursuant to his uh, lawmaking power. So, it's uh, it has the force and effect of a legislation, even if it's a presidential decree. Which is not the the which is not how it is now. You need to you need to have a legislation for that. So that's that's the one from Sandy. Sandy. Mm -hmm. And you can, uh, yeah. How how thank how, you how, thank you, Rocky. I am Sandy. Yeah. And the other one, sorry, I didn't get it. The one from Zaldi. Sorry. How to recommend the Philippine government protect its natural resources and the rights of coastal communities. For the coastal community. <laughs> That's, um, okay. In terms of, in terms of EIA. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, um, thank you, Anna. I, and thank you for your comment about Singapore. I, Lai Ling Heng and I, we, we're gonna move on to have discussions, aren't we, about Singapore EIA law. Um, but but I think that question about yeah um, coastal projects that have resulted in massive environmental degradation and displacement of coastal communities, um, and and as as has been pointed out, you know Philippines does have the laws in place, in particular laws to protect indigenous communities. My my view very much is um, the the issue about what we need to do with EIA is, is not allow it to be static. Um, and issues of coastal resources, you know, corals, seagrass, um, uh, and, and the value of the coastal zone, in my view, need to be sort of fundamentally protected. Um, and partly that also looks at strategic environmental assessment to say governments and private sectors should not consider projects in, in certain areas. Um, for, for example, for ports, you could do a strategic assessment for ports to identify what are the, the better locations for those sort of infrastructure. Um, because one of the, pro or and the same with coastal tourism, identifying and protecting those areas of uh, outstanding um, natural value biodiversity value, social value, you, you have to make it clear that those should be protected so that project proponents and governments aren't going to uh, propose projects in those areas that they, they're done in, in. And that way you are safeguarding. I, I see, uh, Aithiha, did you, would you like to make a comment? You're still on mute. Hi Matthew, how are you? Hi. Yeah, long time no see. Yeah. Long time. Yeah. So I have a, a, a quick question. So concerning with the, this uh, transboundary, you know, the EIA. So so we we also conduct the public public participation in the both in the you know the other country. But one at the time saw the you know the review process. Should the let's say uh, ECD need the, the you know the other country to invite in the this uh, uh, review process or not, or just asking them for the comment? This is uh, my uh, first question. Uh, another one is uh, you know that just a situation. You know you might also aware about the, our country situation. So the recent uh, military uh, council the. They, 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 they say they are just uh, trying to follow the, the, all the, you know, the legislation, but uh, 
in most cases, uh, you know, the, they are trying to overcome all the this uh, EI process, which they think this is, uh, you know, the, the same, you know, the red tape for the investment or development or whatever. So, so, so that is a is a critical issue. Yeah. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you very much, and uh, all the best for you. I think about yeah. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, work over the years um, and a lot of it is, again, uh, balancing that investment um, and environmental protection and social protection. Um, so, and I think this is where, you know, ultimately um, for me, um, I think public participation and engagement um, is fundamental to good environmental impact assessment. Um, and if, you're going, if governments want to um, structure that, as long as there still is genuine participation, but if you're not allowing people to communicate, we, we've had this problem under COVID where people can't come into groups, but we have to use other mechanisms, um, whether it's internet, whether it's working in smaller groups. Um, these are things that we have constantly to adapt. Um, but, but getting community concerns to make sure the project takes into account those social obligations, I think is, is, is very fundamental. In, in terms of, and, and no matter how difficult it is, that just makes it more challenging. And it's a challenging for a project proponent, but if they've got good consultants, those consultants can advise their clients on, on what needs to happen. In conflict zones, this, this is, a challenge for people, but it's also a challenge for investors to say, well, maybe that's not the right place or the right time um, to invest um, in those conflict zones unless you can find uh, support for your project by the community. Um, in terms of the transboundary issue, and this is why I think it is important for governments to um, develop mechanisms, is this idea of, you know, does the consultant firm have to go um, to the other country to conduct public participation or is it done by a local firm? How does that comply with the law? What information is available? Um, this is why I do talk about the Mekong River Commission because they have had a lot of experience. And although some of the problems have arisen um, because a particular national government has approved the project before the consultation, um, nevertheless, the consultation, they've had meetings uh, for example, in the Pak Beng Dam, uh, they had meetings in Thailand, they had meetings in Cambodia to, to gather input and, and comments about the downstream impacts. Um, they hadn't done a great deal of work on, well, the EIA consultants needed to also do some work on the, on the potential downstream or transboundary impact. Um, but that's also something that has to happen you know, uh, in conjunction with public consultation. It's not, it's not easy. Transboundary consultation is not easy. Um, and that's why it needs government to government. But in Europe, um, they've had many years of experience and they've got uh, their now the and the Economic Commission for Europe, which includes Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan and uh, uh, a number of other countries outside of the EU. Um, they've also developed um, documents and processes for transboundary EIA that uh, take into account you know, the challenges of working in, in different countries. Um, so I hope that helps, idea. Yeah, that's, that sounds great, yeah. So we, yeah. The, because uh, it's a transboundary, sometimes it's, uh, you know, the whether, the, you know, the, the other government agency, because uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the different, Government agency they have a different priority, so it might be a sometime you know the it cannot be moved forward. <laughs> that is my concern. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Just about this. Yes, stay safe. Um. So, thank you very much. Um. I see the time. Um. Appreciate all the questions uh, and all the discussions, and I think this is clearly something that is. Uh, necessary to continue, uh, especially on the enforcement and compliance. Um, and I'm looking forward um, at some point, maybe for us to have a masterclass on uh, environment and, and compliance. And thank you, 
uh, attorney, uh, lecturer Devilal in India. Um, so thank you very much, Christina, and, and back to you. Well, thank you, Matthew, and um, thank you for everyone. We, we extend, you're very popular. <laughs> we extended almost 40 minutes. Um, their e-certificates will be generated, Angela, I think immediately if they filled out the form. And yes. um, one of the things we wanted to invite people is to join our regional network, which is on our website. Um, we will send you a link and um, so that you can just also see who else is practicing or teaching environmental law in the region, because um, this has been a, a collection of five you know, years of data from all our TTT programs. And you might want to check out who else is working and, and start contacting each other. So um, thanks very much. And Matthew, bravo. <laughs> Thank you all very much. And uh, again, um, we will, this presentation and the reference documents will go up on the website soon. Um, and uh, we can, uh, um, Angelo has, has put up the registration form to, to keep in touch with our monthly lectures. And this was a monthly lecture series that was started as part of a development of the Myanmar environmental law curriculum with our environmental law champions in Myanmar. Um, that project was halted following uh, the coup on the 1st of February, um, but we wanted to keep the environmental law network in, in our region going. Um, and uh, as, as the, the point was made about um, including um, uh, South Asia. Um, uh, so future topics will look um, broader throughout um, Asia uh, and Southern Asia, as well as Southeast Asia on a number of environmental law um, uh, topics and presentations um, to in order to advance environmental law and more importantly, keep, keep the networks alive um, because the um, networks of environmental lawyers and academics uh, and environmental law champions is very important for ensuring that environmental uh, protection um, is, it, it happens um, and that we work together um, for a much more sustainable uh, and healthy planet. And as Angela has also po pointed out, um, the courses are now being migrated um, to the ADB eLearn um, platform. And there is a link there. If you register for that, um, you will access for free um, a range of uh, um, webinars um, and lots of different uh, environmental law um, courses, uh, environment courses as well. Um, as well as environmental law, we've got some great uh, work on environment and human rights um, by Dr. Jonathan Lillibard, um, Biodiversity in ASEAN um, by Patty Moore, um, and Ben Bohr has um, do his environmental law uh, assessment in the region. So we're looking forward very much to continuing this conversation. But thank you, Christina. Anything else? Thank you, Angelo. Um, and we will be having a, another um, webinar again as part of our environmental law champions uh, in about a month's time, um, the topic to be determined. Um, but thank you all very much and enjoy your weekends. Stay safe. <laughs>